Okay, it's 3.30 and I'd like to begin by welcoming everybody uh, and saying thank you for attending this webinar on assessment design and AI. Before we begin, uh, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the lands, the lands on which we meet today. We pay our respects to their elders and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country and we extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. We thank them for sharing their cultures and spiritualities and recognize the important contribution of this knowledge to our understanding of this place we call home. Once again, thank you for joining us today. I'm Anthony Barnett, Principal Project Officer, Academic Integrity and Research here at the QCAA. I'm joined today by the QCAA officers who are supporting the webinar, Shannon McSweedy and Scott Zadrovec. This webinar will be recorded recorded and an edited version will be available on our website. The chat function, as previously stated, has been enabled to allow you to post questions to the presenters during the webinar if you have them. Once we've heard from our presenters, there will be time to address a few questions, but the chat box will not be included in the recording. The questions you provide and comments are also useful for us at the QCAA as they provide insight into ways that we can support your needs going into the future. So, this is the second in a three-part series on the theme of artificial intelligence and its relevance to academic integrity, assessment design, and digital literacy. This webinar aims to explore the current research on assessment design and artificial intelligence and how it can inform your educational decisions. You will learn about the purpose and qualities of assessment, as well as the opportunities and challenges that AI presents for educators. Today, we have two expert presenters. We're delighted to have Jason Lodge, Associate Professor at the University of Queensland's School of Education, whose focus is on the ways technologies, such as artificial intelligence, are influencing learning and teaching. We will also hear from Ar Marnie Archer, Deputy Principal at Albany Creek State High School, who has a keen interest in assessment design in the junior and senior phases. To remind ourselves of the context for this webinar, Generative Artificial Intelligence, or Gen AI, in the form of ChatGPT, as I'm sure many of us are aware, took the world by storm in November 2022. It sparked concern, interest, transformation, and a deluge of questions about the place of Gen AI and emerging technologies in education. As educators around the world continue to grapple with the implications of these emerging technologies, the opportunities and risks it presents are becoming clearer. So to support schools to implement the Australian curriculum and the QCE in this landscape punctuated by Gen AI, the QCAA has produced a range of resources, including the updated academic integrity courses for students and teachers and AI fact sheets. In addition, we've created this series of three AI-focused webinars, of which, so I mentioned, this is the second. The first webinar in the series discussed academic integrity, ethical scholarship, and AI. And at that webinar, Associate Pro Professor Christina Slade from the University of Queensland explained why students act with integrity, or at times, unfortunately, cheat, and how generative AI can make the possibility of cheating easy. She suggested ways to reduce this misconduct, such as creating positive norms, talking about ethics, building trust, and using generative AI responsibly. In that webinar, we also heard from Scott Adams Adamson from All Hallows School in Brisbane, where he shared his school's experience of dealing with Gen AI, preparing students for a technology-filled world. He emphasized the need for school academic integrity guidelines, teacher support, and critical use of Gen AI. So the main takeaway that we had from that webinar was that students want to learn and that as educators we can help them make positive choices about gen ai the goal of today's webinar then is to connect the principles that shape academic integrity and assessment design we will explore how gen ai can support or challenge these principles and attributes such as equity and validity these have been described by the qcaa in a range of resources I'm sure you're familiar with, including the assessment literacy in the QCE course and the assessment literacy course for Peter 6, 
as well as several fact sheets and guidance documents, all of which are available on our website. And following this webinar, you may want to return to view these again. Now, it's my pleasure to hand over to Jason Lodge, who will share the current state of research into assessment design and AI. And he'll talk about the purpose of assessment, assessment literacy, and sharing why emerging technologies may challenge schools in developing quality assessment. So, over to you, Jason. Thank you, Anthony, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I, too, would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of these lands and pay my respects to elders past and present. Uh, we find ourselves in an interesting time, I think. Uh, Anthony, next slide, please. Uh, I wanted to show you an example of an image that I created in literally seconds. I have no artistic talent whatsoever. Uh, I, I have no ability in this area, but using the tools that are available now, this was generated by a tool called Midjourney that you might, might or might not be familiar with. Uh, I was able to produce this image that perhaps partly captures the current concerns that we might have about the evolution of artificial intelligence and, and robots. I think that this partly captures some of the concerns that we have more broadly about these tools. I'm going to focus somewhat on those concerns, but I also want to talk a little bit about some of the opportunities that run alongside that. Next slide, please, Anthony. At the core of the issue I think that we face, and this follows on from the previous webinar about academic integrity, that we have a situation where tools are now available where all sorts of different artifacts, including the image that I just showed you, can be generated with no additional work, no background work. And of concern for us is that there can be potentially no learning occurring. I'm going to give you some examples of this further on, but I think that it's important that we're kind of clear on what we think this, the sort of key problem is that we're dealing with. And part of this is that we obviously use different types of artifacts, whether that's a report or an essay, some other kind of written submission that students make to get a sense of how they're progressing in their learning. So if those sorts of artifacts can be produced without that learning occurring, then we have something that we probably need to pay attention to. Next slide, please, please Anthony. Now, part of the discussion that's happened this year has uh, obviously led to, again, many of you be, will be familiar with this, the Australian Framework for Generative AI in, school, in Schools. There are very important factors in there that have been addressed, and these are things like privacy, equity, transparency, bias in the large language models that are out there, like the one that sits underneath ChatGPT. And I think that this sets a very good foundation that we can now build on to think about how we might meaningfully use these tools and help students learn with these tools. And importantly for the discussion that we're having today, how we might make sure that our assessment processes are robust to the existence of these tools now becoming available. Next slide, please. I've got a few slides here. Sorry, Anthony, <laughs> a bit of skipping forward. So turning our attention much more to the assessment design piece in this. A few months ago, uh, some colleagues and I put together what we thought was our best guess of what the options were on the table and what their viability were is over the short, medium and long term. And you can see here that we started thinking about what does it mean if we were to ignore these tools? What is it if we try to ban them? What role does invigilation play? Do we need to think about embracing these tools? How do we design around them? Or do we need to rethink some of our assessment practices overall? We can't ignore this. I think that it's fair to say that the certainly the global mood around this and a lot of the research that's happening is suggesting that the genie is out of the bottle, that the sorts of large language models like ChatGPT and Bing and BARD are increasingly becoming part of the applications and productivity tools that we all use day to day. So Microsoft are embedding these uh, large language models within Word and PowerPoint and Excel. So the idea that we can ignore these tools, that it's going to be some fad that's going to disappear, I think is looking less likely. And I've heard commentary from people who have been working in these areas for a long time who are saying that the 
relationship that we have with knowledge and information and the change that is represented by generative AI is as fundamental as it was when the internet first became available and widely used. Obviously, this has happened a little faster, though. Can we ban these tools? Well, given that they are going to be embedded within and are already becoming embedded within all many of the major productivity tools that we use day to day, that's already looking quite problematic. And in the long term, we probably need to think a bit more about what that might mean. Uh, so banning these things looks like being a bit of a problem, but that's a longer conversation that I think we will continue to have. By invigilation, we're talking here about how do we run things like pen and paper exams so that we can be absolutely certain that the students that we are working with are meeting the outcomes that we're looking for. There's always been a case for those kinds of assessments and there will continue to be, we think, into the foreseeable future. Embracing these technologies, and again, given how fundamental these are to the way that we will potentially work and learn on into the future, we do need to be mindful of the issues that these technologies bring, including equity issues and the bias that I mentioned before, where the data is being held and whose data is being used for what. Those are serious questions that we need to consider. And that is, I think, why there is such an emphasis on that in the national framework. But over the longer term, we need to think about how we embrace this in our assessment practices and in our learning. The fifth one there is about how we design around these tools and Early on, when we had GPT 3.5 at the beginning of the year, for anybody who was playing with these tools back then, there were some, I think it's fair to say, significant holes in the data that was available. And it looked at that stage as though we could design assessment tasks that meant that using these tools, we're not going to provide students with a good response. So I tested this out with some of the assessments that I assigned to my students here at the university. And the response it gave was was pretty poor because the information that it was drawing on was not uh, as robust as it could have been. That's changed already as these models are being upgraded. And it's now looking like if we're trying to design assessment to target the weaknesses of these tools, that is becoming something that is not looking particularly viable as well. They're able to actually produce quite good responses to a lot of questions. So that leaves us with the sixth option there and one that we've been spending a lot of our time and effort on here at the university and nationally, and I'll talk about this in a second, is to rethink some of the assessment processes that we've got. Now, that might mean things that we have been doing traditionally for a long time, uh, but it also means to think about how do we build on good assessment practices we know um, as it currently exists. So that's been our effort, and I'll give you a bit of a sense of how we've progressed with that. Um, in the last few months. Next slide, please, Anthony. So I think one of the things that has caught our attention and something that we've needed to consider as far as the assessment design piece goes is that on one side of this, we are learning more and more about what these tools can actually do. So our starting point at the beginning of the year was that we were concerned that students would take an assigned task put it into a tool like ChatGPT, ChatGPT would generate a response that students would then submit as an artifact for that assessment piece. In the meantime, and we're collecting some data around this with some students here at the university, we're seeing that there are all sorts of possibilities for these tools as part of the learning process that include working as a study buddy or a personal tutor for them to use the tool to come up with ideas for a brainstorming process and so on. So it's a little bit more complicated than just this idea that students will submit work that has been taken out of a generative AI tool. There is a bit more to it and we've needed to incorporate that into our thinking about what assessment design might look like. What we hope that we don't end up with is a situation where the sophistication of these tools leads us to a future that might look something like this, where we really rely very heavily on pen and paper exams for all of the assessment that we carry out. Now that, as I said before, is absolutely suitable and appropriate in certain circumstances and will continue to be a feature of the way that we assess, I think. 
However, there are going to be many circumstances where we want to get a different sense of our students' learning and we need a different kind of assessment approach. This is certainly the case in the courses that I teach with my students. Uh, it's not just about their ability to be able to respond to a set of exam questions. I want to see different ways that they're working with knowledge and are able to use that knowledge. So this is one part of the equation, but we hope that it's not the only part of the kind of assessment design that we're considering. Next slide, please, Anthony. So separating those things out, so we have some challenges, we have some more ideas about how these tools can be used, and we don't want to be in a situation where we're just relying wholly on, on external um, and high stakes exams for, for all of our assessment approaches. So what does it mean to rethink the assessment that we, we currently have? And how do we need to adapt that to the fact that these new tools exist and are, are available. And these are some of the things that we've been thinking about. So authenticity, contextual information, that the assessment has some sort of purpose and that's clear to students. There is elements of critical and creative thinking, which I'm gonna pick up on again shortly, that there is some ownership that students can feel of the assessment activities that they're engaged in, that it starts to get at the process of learning as it occurs over time rather than a kind of snapshot approach that a lot of assessment we know um, takes and it builds on the idea that it's a that students are involved in a relationship with us there is a a community that we hope that that we develop in our classrooms and that somehow the assessment we hope would capture that for us we come back often to this idea that education is not a transaction it's about a relationship it's a relational activity and the more that we can think about that as part of our assessment processes, we hope that um, that will then allow us to come up with really effective assessment practices. Next slide, please, Anthony. I think it's fair to say that one of the key things that we've, uh, I guess, realized or gone back to through the process of rethinking assessment is that there are many components of good assessment design that are robust to the situation we find ourselves in now. So nothing that I'm hopefully saying here is giving you any impression that what good assessment design looks like should change. The core still relates to these things. It should be aligned with the curriculum. It should be equitable for all students. It should be evidence-based. We should be thinking about it as, a, as something that occurs over time and is, in, and, and is ongoing. And it's transparent so that it allows us to have some confidence in the assessment process. And it should be informative to students about their learning. So feedback should be part of this situation as well. So I think the QCAA guidelines here about assessment hold. And I think that these are things that we still need to pay attention to and give us good guidance about where we might head with all of this. From there, I think at a higher level, next slide, please, Anthony. Are you getting good at predicting what I when I need this the next slide? We also need to be thinking about the core attributes of, of assessment, validity, accessibility, reliability. All right, so for those who are in, uh, who like the sort of uh, psychometric view of the world, these are also things that I think, again, provide us a solid foundation. Do we need to change some things that we do? I think that that's becoming clear, but we're not in a situation here where we're throwing the baby out of the bathwater. Assessment design is good assessment design, um, and that should continue to be the foundation for, for what we do. That being said, moving on to the, the next part, we were tasked by the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency back in August to do some work about what, it, what does rethinking assessment design look like with AI in the mix. Now, I know that this is coming from a tertiary perspective, but we feel as though the work that we did is hopefully of some use. And that's why I thought I'd give you a sense of what we arrived at um, through this work. So how this uh, formed and the process that we went through is that we brought some of the leading experts in the country together. And these are experts in assessment design, in assessment of, with artificial intelligence and uh, experts who look at various different educational systems. What we wanted to do in that process is, is to come up with uh, some guidance we can't develop a map of what the future might look like because things are changing very rapidly. But we felt what we could do is at least provide a sense of the direction that we need to head in. And we feel as though we've tried to produce something here that 
could serve as a compass per se rather than a map and the things that we landed on are on the next slide we have two guiding principles and three sorry five propositions beyond that now this builds on what i've mentioned previously about good assessment design and about the things that we know as a foundation are important to think about with ai that are in the national framework so the first thing here is that we feel as though it's a really important for us to be considering very carefully about the world in which our students are going to go out into and how artificial intelligence is going to interact with that world so we want to try and equip students to be able to thrive in the world that we now find ourselves in so that was one of our first guiding principles here secondly we think that uh, and this feeds on from what we've just talked about in terms of the QCAA documentation and guidance is that we want to have reliable judgments about student learning and that we want to think about multiple inclusive and contextualized assessment approaches we felt that this also was a very good and important guiding principle for the ways in which we might rethink assessment from this point the five propositions that we then also came up with as a result of this collaboration are on the next slide we need to think about what an authentic engagement with ai looks like as part of the assessment process we need to think about assessment across not just one item or one unit but about what that looks like across for us that means a degree program in your context that could mean what does it look like over a term or over a whole year or over a larger kind of volume of learning we need to emphasize the learning process as part of all of this as i've alluded to before we need to think about how students are working with each other and how they work with us and what happens with that relative to artificial intelligence when that gets mixed into the equation there and we also need to, need to think about the kinds of things that christine was talking about in the last webinar like how can we ensure academic integrity at, at critical points during st a students learning journey so those are the key foundational principles that we're working with at the tertiary level and the propositions that we're thinking about in terms of the direction that we need to take to rethink the assessment of processes it raises the question from here though about how do we take a bottom up approach that will align with the sort of top down approach that some of these guidance and frameworks uh, give us as a way that we might progress and from here we then need to, to start thinking about well what does it look like for individual kinds of tasks how do we help empower all of our teachers who are already stressed who already have a high workload who already have a lot of other things that they need to think about to be able to make good decisions about individual kinds of tasks that they need to to adapt and, and perhaps change to now adapt to this world that we find ourselves in there are a couple of key challenges here i think the first on the next slide is that there are a lot of weird ideas out there about some of the things that we need to consider when bill gates for example heralded in this new world of and reality of artificial intelligence he talked about learning styles as being a key thing that we might need to adapt to so a lot of the global ideas around what we need to do with assessment and what we need to do in education are not founded on some ideas that have the strongest evidence behind them um, i don't know many of you will know that the idea of learning styles visual learners auditory learners has very little to any evidence sitting behind it so a lot of the discussion that's coming from the technical side of all of this doesn't align with the sorts of things that we need to think about and the sorts of evidence that we've gained from our educational environments so this is also making this idea of how we might change individual tasks a bit challenging there are also some elements in this where we haven't quite got all of the pieces together we need to do a lot of research to understand how the learning is working with these tools how does that align with the way that we understand learning what do we see in our classrooms and how do all these things come together through what we call a consilience that might inform our action so there is a challenge here that is about how we might work together across sectors to figure out what that might look like given a lot of these tools are so new and that we're still all collectively trying to figure out how they might best work in the learning process 
we've got some work to do to line everything up so that we know how best to do it. So again, I think that provides a little bit of a challenge to, to how we might implement this. The third component in this, I think, is that we don't want the technology to be driving what we do in assessment. Partly, we want to make sure that the pedagogy does, and certainly technology and pedagogy need to feature in what our considerations are. But as my colleague here, Tim Fawns from Monash University talks about, these things are really entangled together. So if we think about how we might change our assessment design, we need to think about the technology. We need to think about the curriculum. We need to think about the syllabus. We need to think about the context we find ourselves in. So what all of this, I think, points to is that we have a complex set of factors that we need to consider if we're going to change and rethink what assessment might look like. That doesn't mean that it's insurmountable. And I think one thing that gives me a lot of hope here is that we're working together to try and figure this out. So it's complicated, but I think that we're making some fairly significant strides forward to think about what this might look like so that we can, again, empower our teachers to be able to make good decisions about individual assessment tasks within a broader uh, context of the sorts of changes that we've talked about already. So what does that look like in a very concrete way? And what I wanted to give you a sense here is what this might look like for uh, particular kinds of examples. And one thing that we're using here to think about the changes in assessment tasks from that ground up perspective, so next slide please Anthony, is what's called the SAMA model. So across the different types of tasks that we might be assigning students to do, do we need to think substituting that task? Do we need to think about augmenting it? Do we need to think about modifying it in some way? Or do we need to kind of redefine what that task is and how it works? So I wanted to give you a bit of a case study here to give you a sense of the way that we're approaching these kinds of um, questions that we have about individual sorts of tasks. And we wanted to focus here on a particular kind of written assessment. Now this will vary depending on your context. This could be an essay or a report uh, or some other sort of written artifact. So I'm gonna to refer to essays a little bit here, but really the kinds of changes that we're talking about here uh, are other sorts of things that we might see across a submitted written kind of task that we might ask students to do. So if we think about our SAMA model here, the first of these considerations is to substitute, right? So if machines are able to do some of these kinds of tasks, do we need to think about substituting completely and aligned with the way that uh, generative AI might do the task to reimagine what that task might look like? So an example of this might be, okay, if uh, generative AI can produce the kind of artifact that I'm looking for. For example, I ask my students to generate a lesson plan. Would a better way to go here be to substitute that task with an AI-generated lesson plan and then get the students to work on what they think is good or bad about that generated um, artifact, how they would improve it, what they might do differently, and so on and so on. So rather than getting them to do that work, I'm substituting that with what a machine might do, and then we build on that through the assessment. The second approach here would be to augment, and by this we mean that we still have the task in a way that it was previously. Yep, we skipped one there, sorry, Anthony. <laughs> um, what does that look like when we augment it? And for this kind of activity, we're really thinking about, okay, if we've got this written task, be it an essay or something else, can we take that as a basis and can we use the technology to build on it? So we can we potentially allow the students to integrate the way that they're going about producing this task and doing the learning that's required to, to get to that end point and integrate the technology into that. And on the next slide, we can think about different levels at which we might be prepared to allow students to do that. So am I going to say to students, okay, we would like you to produce an essay yourself but we're going to allow you to do some editing and some grammar checking and those sorts of activities that might allow them to take something that they've produced and make it even more polished. And are we prepared to allow that to happen? So in that way, we're allowing a level of augmentation to occur there. The third level, and we'll start to sort of get towards the end here and wrap this up. Do we need to modify the essay? Do we need to make it something different? Do we need to add, for example, an oral component? to that. 
Some colleagues of mine at the University of Melbourne thought about the ways that we could modify essays at the beginning of the year. And despite the changes and updates in the technology, most of these still hold. So there are ways that we could potentially modify these written tasks. They could focus more on critical thinking, for example, or they could draw on specific aspects of the syllabus that are very contextualized. They could focus on things that occur in, in a local environment that a large language model that's sitting on a server somewhere in North America is not necessarily going to capture the nuances of. Um, could we make it more about kind of value judgments that are more about students themselves and what they value in the world? So the evidence is suggesting that there are some really effective ways that we are able to modify written tasks like essays that make them pretty robust to this. Beyond that, we could then redefine what the essay means as part of the student's educational experience. And there is some work out there thinking about creative writing in particular. On the next slide, there are some ways that we can consider, and there was a, an article about this in Harvard Business Review towards the end of last year. As we think about things like automation and the quality and variety of things that artificial intelligence can do, do we need to reconsider what the role of the essay is more broadly? Is it the kind of thing that people are going to be doing in the same way that we have thought of it traditionally um, when we didn't have generative AI in the mix? And do we need to adapt our assessment um, in regards to that? So from there, I think we can start to see that there are some ways that we could potentially adapt what we're doing. We could also think about the kinds of standards that we implement. So if we're going to allow students to work more with artificial intelligence, do we set our expectations in a different way so that we would expect, for example, grammar to be pretty well spot on because they've got the opportunity to be able to use the tool to help them with that aspect of their learning. We can also, on the next slide, think about the role of critical thinking and what kinds of mental skills are going to be of more value than others as generative AI and other AI tools are going to be able to do more of that kind of work. So for us, we're starting to, on the next slide, separate out what are the sorts of things that we know that generative AI as a technology is going to be pretty good at and what are the sorts of things that students are going to continue to be good at and us as humans more broadly are going to be good at. Do we need to focus our assessment more on the, the human components and think about the way that we might build written tasks, for example, that require more evaluation or meaning making or give us some more insight into the way that students are regulating their own learning. So those are the sorts of things that we're thinking about. And as a, I think where this leaves us is that we have some really good foundations through the national framework. We hope that we've been able to provide some guidance through the work that we've been doing with TEXA. And we're now in a situation where I think we can start to think quite carefully and in a nuanced way about how we might adapt and update the various different kinds of assessment activities that we assign for our students. We're working on a suite of resources here, and I know that there is work going on around the country and indeed around the world to make that process uh, as straightforward for teachers as possible. Because as I said before, we know that we're already facing um, a lot of things that we need to balance as teachers day to day in our work. How can we help to help teachers to make good decisions about what rethinking assessment might look like on into the future as we have these new, new tools um, and help us to come up with the best assessment design that we can that is robust to the, the existence of these tools and how they're going to be integrated into our lives. So hopefully that was useful to give you a sense about where that's going. We've still got a lot of work to do. Um, and uh, yeah, we look forward to working together to figure out what this might look like. Anthony, back to you. Thank you very much, Jason. That was fascinating and thought-provoking, uh, your presentation about those uh, sort of assessment ideas in this Gen AI age. I found it particularly sort of fascinating, your focus there on sort of the different types of uh, written responses, uh, which might apply across all subject areas, uh, whether they're essays, short responses, reports, science, maths, uh, humanities, arts, uh, languages. And really that connection you made between those pillars of assessment design that we we already have and the fact that those are, hold us in a strong place and that we should then think about how Gen AI fits in to that rather than the technology coming in first. So 
thank you very much for that. And I think it sets us up really well now as we welcome uh, Marnie Archer, and she's going to share with us the work uh, that she has led in her school to prepare guidelines and uh, that will support teachers to adjust to the emergence of Gen AI and share some examples of the work. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, over to you, Marnie. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all of the lands that we meet on today and acknowledge Elders past, present and emerging, given that we're chiming in from all over Queensland. Um, I guess I'm, I'm, there are about eight slides that I've got to talk to, so Anthony can keep pace um, and click along with me. Uh, but uh, I suppose a couple of the things is to provide some context for where we found ourselves and, I mean, as Jason outlined, um, AI kind of began as a, you know, exciting little fire and rapidly became a firestorm um, that impacted us in schools pretty quickly in assessments. Um, and so as it as it emerged, we really quickly noticed that it was going to have uh, or was almost immediately having a pretty significant impact, specifically in extended written assessment. And so at our school, we have um, very tight uh, committee structures and part of the um, one of the committees that I chair is the curriculum teaching and learning committee and so obviously that became a, a feature of conversation in that committee and then more broadly in our extended leadership teams and in our faculties um, and for different faculties it was impacting more immediately than others so certain quarters of like the assessments that I'll talk about a little bit later um, sort of features that particularly in the humanities it, it became uh, an almost instant um, concern. So around that, we had a few key questions that came out of that professional conversation um, in those different forums about what did the use of generative AI and assessment constitute for us? What did it mean? Um, did our existing assessment policy have the capacity to respond to its use? Or was there going to be sort of a bit, bit of bush lawyering around, you know, on a technicality, I'm going to use this as you don't have anything written down that might make this possible. Um, and what should our collective response as a school community be to managing that? And not just from uh, a staffing only um, sense of management, but about us as, as a collective, as a school community, and that being all of our stakeholders being involved in what that process might look like and how we could make it um work for us i guess um and with us and i think some of the stuff that jason was saying before is part of that process of the, the rethink approach um and, and the same model which is part of our professional conversations here too he made a mention before about the gene being out of the bottle and we well and truly understood that so there was no really um sort of hiding in the corner and pretending that it wasn't going to be something that we had to respond to. So we sort of tried to move on the front foot about what we could do and how we could respond and actually use it um, as a superpower, really, in our teaching and learning um, and a way to then reinterrogate our assessment culture. Can I have the next slide in? So in, in that first question about what did it, constitute for us, we realised that as I had to understand more and more, um, I'd also like to point out that, Anthony, I don't know if I've got a keen interest in AI. I think that perhaps it's out of necessity I've developed a very comprehensive interest in AI um, as because, because we were then sort of interrogating our assessment policy and our existing assessment culture, which I'll talk about a little bit as well, uh, we considered that because generative AI was training itself on material source from across the internet, if students were using that without appropriate or correct referencing, then they weren't behaving in an ethical way as a scholar, but also we did feel as though it had a provision in our existing assessment policy around it being plagiarism or even to a degree contract cheating where they were basically um, utilising someone to someone, in inverted commas, to, um, to generate the material that they were then saying was their own. Uh, so when we sort of had that first that first sort of blush of, okay, well, what does this mean for us? Is it okay for people to use? Is it not? And then we 
fairly quickly came to the idea that no, it's not okay in the way that it was. We were seeing it being evidenced by kids, and and saw that more as okay, this is starting to become about ethical use, and then starting to lead us down a, a very specific kind of direction. Next slide, please. So for us, our our existing policy had um, very explicit sections about managing academic misconduct and we talk very clearly about what our expectations are of being an ethical scholar um, and what all the different possibilities or examples of academic misconduct might be and in that plagiarism is clearly one um, and so for us we we really were locating it and labeling it very explicitly as an issue of academic integrity and that it could be considered either plagiarism or contract cheating and then we realised, yes, it does It does do that already, but we also thought, okay, we need to be more on the front foot here about having a conversation with our students and more broadly in our school community with parents and carers around what AI is and does and what its impact is on student learning and their outcomes. Um, so we then sort of went back to our assessment policy to consider how we needed to frame that up so that it not only was more comprehensive and explicit about AI in the actual policy document, but it was then the sort of leaping off point for us to have those conversations more broadly in our school community. Um, now up the next one, please. Um, so from that then, it was really around us looking at these are the sort of four key, I know it's significant, and I should also have said right at the beginning, we as a school are at the beginning of this process and we see so many opportunities around the application of AI uh, that it's it's a process that we're really orienting ourselves to and sort of responding to rather than reacting to. We're trying to sort of come to understand um, a lot of the things and how it's impacting on how we have previously done business and how we need to go forward and do business differently, which I think speaks to um, the work that Jason's been doing and what he articulated earlier. So I think the, the big things for us were that we needed to amend our assessment policy um, to be very explicit around that. We also needed to consider our assessment instruments and we, we have a very strong um, assessment culture at our school, a, a professional assessment culture around our school where we've worked very hard to have a consistent approach to the presentation of assessments, the use of language and expression, the explicit nature of cognitions. So we have worked very hard with that. I would feel very confident about the level of confidence and capacity in our staff to design quality assessment. Um, so, but we also recognise that AI was presenting a factor that previously we hadn't really considered in how it might impact our need to redesign or reinterrogate uh, our assessment instruments that we that we currently have, and so in that we realised that while we have a strong assessment culture, we really wanted to and needed to put ethical scholarship at the front of the story, and so that it wasn't a punitive conversation around you've cheated or you know framing it in that way, but trying to interrogate that and build that. Um, community understanding around what ethical scholarship is and and academic citizenship or even just kind of just citizenship really about being part of a school community and why people might do that um, behave in a way that's not um, with integrity in terms of their academic work. So we realised there was there was work to do around that and that also we needed to teach the principles of that um, and demonstrate the principles of that to our years, seven to 12 students. And from that, I think, is the story around, um, you know, why why AI can be fabulous and have so many opportunities and possibilities that, yes, there's a space for it in assessment. The space really is around pedagogy and that's its massive opportunity is around but our focus being really shifted to an application of AI in that space and using it like we would have um, considered any any tool previously. Um, 
and and teaching people how to use that tool in effective, respectful and appropriate ways. And for us, uh, our in, in that sort of assessment culture, um, assessment and academic conduct kind of space and assessment design space, we were really having those conversations with kids and with staff around um, <clears throat> we want for them to be using it responsibly and trying to tie that to the principles and values that we have in the school community that we talk about quite a lot um, so that it was everything was running through that idea of um, how do we redesign things if we need to to act responsively to this advent of new technology, but how do we also work to build a want to do that, a, a revision of our practices to make sure that um, we're getting the best out of what's available to us in terms of teaching and learning resources and tools, but also getting the best out of our students both um, in their academic performance but also in um you know, the demonstration of being ethical and honest humans. Next one, please. So specific, I mean, this is you know, more just for information really about how explicit we went. Um, we emphasised that ethical scholarship assessment review and assessment health principles that I've talked about so far. And we, we made a decision at least at this point around saying that the use of AI for assessment um, is prohibited and that's as, as we currently have the use for it to generate your assessment response is prohibited. We did come up with um, some different provisions for us to again as part of our assessment culture and sort of looking at our assessment instruments over time to consider the use of AI which I think Jasmine's talking about as well how might we use AI in the context of a piece of assessment um, and be completely hand on heart happy to do so and feel like it would be, in fact, a very useful or powerful tool to use to move a student from point A to point B, whatever that might be, in whatever subject that might be. Um, so I haven't included that here, but, but we do have that as part of our next sort of stage of our assessment design and assessment cultural kind of development, I guess. Um, so we talked around that about sort of emphasising in our current sort of space the use of it without an acknowledgement or a referencing. Um, generally, this is for the future, would be explicitly stated. But at the moment, we've said well, we need to think more on this currently. It is around where we're seeing evidence of students using it in a way without saying, um, well, I have to use this instead, rather saying this is my words and my work. And so we were just having a response to that specifically um, and then talk to other things that might be able to be included about, say, for example, if there was permissible use that it would need to be attributed correctly and we showed them how they might do that um, in terms of how we would teach appropriate referencing. Um, so can I have the next slide? Okay, so in, in that I've spoken to some of this already, that we, in our conversations, those professional conversations and forums I was talking about earlier, what became um, clear was that the reliability story of assessment was that if we could, and I know I'm using shorthand there, but if you can AI us and get an adequate response from it, then we needed to revise um, and review the task or its conditions or some of the other aspects, which I think some of that is, is what Jason was speaking to before around reliability of assessment. And I think it is a really critical piece because he, I, I also was sort of cheering quietly over here on my future microphone when he said it. We, want, we don't want a situation where we sort of go to 100% standardised assessments um, or we go to this exclusive sort of pen and paper Kind of context, it would be um, unfortunate, I think, in the 21st century to do that for a start, but I think it would also have the potential to be quite um, adversely impactful on probably some KLOs and subject areas and others. Um, so I think the thing for us too is that we then were looking at our assessment practices and feeling like we had quite a high level of confidence in that design culture in our school and felt quite confident 
that some of the features of timed assessment were what we needed to bring into our assessment design, re-interrogations and bring uh, those of concepts or qualities of timed assessment into non-timed techniques. Um, that idea of sort of observable evidencing from students and having a staged assessment, so a component, um, yeah, they might do part A and be able to evidence that, need to have you be able to observe that, provide feedback to that before they can progress to part B, uh, rather than producing, you know, what might have been previously parts A, B or C or whatever, but all presented as one task that could have been put into um, a generative AI engine that created a response. And certainly that was some of the concerns raised by our history teachers, um, that they had very good uh, assessment instruments and task statements, and, yeah, they were playing with it, sort of putting those tasks into generative AI and actually getting responses where early on there was like, yeah, not, not as alarmed, um, and then very quickly, oh, yes, sort of more five-bell alarm around it was just rapidly improving in its capacity um so we had to consider what that might look like and then of course the assessment culture story which i was talking about before about ethical scholarship and then re-embracing ai as part of teaching and learning um, and using it as a functional useful tool in the classroom as uh, a pedagogical strategy um can i have the next slide please? <laughs> Um, so our collective response to managing that was, as we said, you know, the idea around um, educating ourselves and so uh, sharing uh, professional readings or uh, discussing particular things that different members of our community had learned or considered or were sort of ruminating on in those different forums. We talked to that, our assessment policy conversations, and then also that idea of leading into the idea of um, ethical scholarship and the development of a junior academic integrity course that we have in a draft form currently uh, that's a bit of a uh, modelled on the senior academic integrity course, but obviously for a junior audience so that we can feel confident that we're speaking to those other kind of cultural aspects of, of why students are drawn to AI, not necessarily around the sort of desire to deceive, I guess, but more some of the factors around why why do students do that sort of stuff even before it was AI, that there could be a whole lot of factors like peer pressure or there could be, um, you know, concerns or pressures from home about student performance and things like that. So there are features of that that we've tried to lock into some of our school values uh, around being responsible uh, respectful and resilient students um, and understanding how that works um, in that way. So that's that's an infancy, but it's certainly something that um, we're very motivated to try and continue to build that in our school community. But the next slide, please. And so the last piece that I want to talk about was an example um, from our humanities uh, faculty which it just gives you a little bit of a sense. I probably want to draw you most specifically to the table that you can see on that second page of the task, um, where, as I was saying earlier, some of the principles of time assessment, where, you know, there's sort of incremental or junctures at which um, teachers are observing evidence being demonstrated um, either quite literally in front of them, or they're things that are necessary in order to progress to the next part of the piece of assessment in some way. Um, that's certainly been the first and most immediate response that's been met with a pretty effective um, sort of management of that original uh, initial issue. And then obviously going forward, being very explicit around those checkpoints and um, how we're authenticating student work in that way, but also sort of the future conversations around what are we asking our students to do and interrogating, as Jason was saying, what are the ways that we might be able to use AI um, in a way that may mean that we need to re-interrogate the way that we are asking kids to do things for us. Are there things that we just no longer need to ask them to do and they may be those lower order conditions? Um, and more sort of one of those slides that I think Jason showed towards the end around the sort of robotic brain 
around those cognitive processes that we um, we we want to retain. Yeah, you know, we want to retain seeing the students' evidence in those, and what are the contexts or forums or needs or modes that we might be able to see that from them, um, and then use AI more proactively um, in assessment. But as I said at the beginning. That's where a work in progress in that way. Um, so that's probably our story sort of in a nutshell. I think I'm coming pretty close to my 10 minute allocation. Anyway. I'd like that minute, please. Um, so that's probably me. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Marnie. And uh, abs absolutely, I'll make sure that's minuted. And you also said something that was, was uh, you know, really sort of useful to hear is that. Uh, you know, many of us out there have come to uh, have a keen interest in AI out of necessity and thinking about how it's developed, you know, uh, and impacting and affecting us in the education world. But it was also really nice to uh, to hear there the, the insights you were giving us around when which you put values at the centre of what you're doing in terms of reevaluating assessments. It's being driven by the values of uh, learning that you are prioritizing in the values of assessment that you then want to be able to see and very much focusing on what's right now, but also mindful that what happens in the future may well be something different. So, um, you know, that has been great then to be able to tie that all the way through to uh, applying that to a, a real example in, in your own school there with that year eight assessment task and how that might also have those same features that could be applied to other subject areas. So the next thing that uh, we're going to do is in the uh, remaining time, we have, uh, we're going to have uh, just a few questions for Jason and Marnie. And I know that there's been um, the sort of uh, chat function and uh, we've got Sort of a few things going in there. Uh, so just looking at those questions, and we've only got a few minutes, we're just going to go to uh, something that, that was already asked even before the uh, the, assess the uh, webinar began. So I hope everyone's in with that. Is that um, obviously uh, in the documents we've already been seen from AA and non referred to as well, the sort of talk about quality assessment needs to be valid, reliable, accessible, and authentic. Which of those elements do we think are being most affected by general AI at all? But I don't know if uh, Marnie, you might want to, or Jason, you might want to begin with that first. So, uh, hand over to uh, to you first, Jason, and then maybe Marnie next. So, Jason, what do you think about uh, which actually what quality assessment can be being affected most? Uh, I think for us, what we've grappled with most is is problems around validity. I think um, ultimately, I, I think the what it boils down to is that um, we have a situation where machines can now kind of circumvent our ability to be able to make good inferences on the basis of submitted work. So, to me, I think it starts to get at that uh, that kind of um, being a valid inference for us. So from there, we then need to think about all of the changes that I've talked about. How do we, you know, take account of the fact that machines can circumvent our ability to be able to make those kinds of inferences? Um, so then I think that means you probably need to lean a little heavier on the other components that you've just talked about. So how do we rebalance things on the basis of that one being slightly problematic? Um, Marnie, would you like to sort of um, just weigh in there? Oh, sorry, your microphone is just muted. So, I would like to say what he said. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I agree. Okay. Brilliant. Uh, well, okay. Well, if uh, we're in agreement, what we'll do is just uh, sort of looking at another question that's also been posed uh, previously. Um, when we, uh, one of the things that's been talked about is uh, addressing uh, assessments and the and the impact of Gen AI by looking at the process of learning rather than that end product or artifact. And that's sort of been referenced by both Jason and Marnie. So just thinking, maybe starting with you, Marnie, is there a sort of a way you're thinking about addressing that process of learning 
they can capture things in that way. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I spoke a little bit to that before where it's really about us sort of leaning more into that idea that AI is not something for our profession to be scared of, but rather to be excited by it as a tool to be used effectively and maybe not um, to, to really lean into it, actually consider it's used pedagogically, how might we use it as another piece of technology as we've used over the last you know, however many decades when there's been a new piece of technology. Granted, having said that, it is a very special and specific type of technology that's currently um, getting smarter and smarter every day. I think um, the the opportunity really is about shifting the process back a bit into that teaching and learning space and using it and demonstrating its use in ethical and honest ways. Um, and exciting and fun and engaging ways as well, so that there's not this um, sort of abrupt end point at the assessment part of the story where then there's this high degree of panic around can we believe what we're reading or can we believe what is being evidenced by a student because that just feels icky to me. That's great. Jason, do you want to uh, add anything more? I think it's going to be an agree on here, Anthony. Um, <laughs> Fully, fully agree with that. Um, I think uh, one of the things I always come back to is that I think that there are parts of this that are are complex and there are reasons why we have assessed the way that we have traditionally. But this is where I also think that AI is as much part of the solution perhaps as it is part of the problem, which I think builds on, on Marty's point that she's already made, that there are probably lots of ways that we could get some more insight into learning processes. And over time, I think we'll start to be able to use these technologies to, to help give some of those insights. But we've got a little bit of work to do, I think, to, to figure out how best to do that in an ethical and appropriate way. Can I add something to that, Anthony, too? I just, I just realised another thing, too, just as Jason was saying, that the, the opportunity, I think, too, is around the real power of AI as a, a supportive tool, a supportive learning tool for students um, in, you know, in terms of learning support. You know, it is a really powerful device in that way to to build capability, capacity, and confidence for students with additional needs, um, a, a whole raft of things where there's, I mean, just immediately, that's an amazing superpower of AI. Um, so I think it is definitely something for us to lean into. Sorry, I just wanted to say that. No, that's really useful, really positive. And I suppose just conscious of sort of uh, our time as we're going through here, uh, there's a technical question which has come up, which might be something that Jason might be able to uh, respond to. And I know it's sort of uh, one out there that's sort of still a work in progress. Is uh, that idea of who owns the outputs generated by sort of general AI tools, because obviously if we're going to be using them we, uh, in an ethical way, we're going to have to think very con very clearly about that. So I don't know, Jason, if there's a few words quickly you want to mention about that. I can talk about that. I'm going to talk about it from a slightly different perspective as a journal editor. So we've had to think about this very carefully with people submitting work to a journal and what uh, level of responsibility we have to give to various agents in the equation. For us, the bottom line is we need to be able to point to a human. So there is no referencing artificial intelligence. There is no putting artificial intelligence on as an author. It is a tool because ultimately as journal editors, we have to be clear that there is a level of responsibility for what is published in the journal. That responsibility is with the authors and it's not with a machine. Now, maybe that will change in the future, but for us, it was very clear that we could not treat generative AI as an agent, and therefore the, we had to be able to point to a person who was, was responsible for what's in there. That's great. Thank you very much for that perspective on on sort of that thorny issue uh, that's, uh, that we're all starting to grapple with. Um, look, at this stage, is sort of uh, we just have a few minutes left in the webinar. I just want to say a big thank you for those responses to those questions and from the presentations. Uh, certainly, yeah, it's something which you know, I hope the, uh, you and the audience have gained a great deal from Jason and Marnie's responses uh, and from your uh, participation in this webinar on art assessment design and artificial intelligence. I can certainly say in terms of 
having sat here and listened and gone through, you know, the takeaways that I have around this are, are really sort of quite reassuring and confidence building that we've got uh, quality uh, principles uh, and strong attributes of assessment design uh, that we can come back to and they remain foundation and regardless of whether we're in the uh, Australian curriculum space or the QCE space, we'll still strive for those uh, features such as reliable, equitable and valid assessments. And also, the, you know, despite the challenges of Gen AI, there are, as Moni sort of really led us to, sort of things that are already happening in the school space. And as Jason has alluded to, research going on and thinking going on around how we sort of holistically think about um, this sort of uh, new technology to maintain our assessment uh, principles. And also that while this webinar is part of a series of responding to emerging technology to Gen AI, remembering that uh, you know the technology is just one part of what we're doing. The technology is there to support the learning assessment that we've always wanted to do, and the importance remains of the relations relationships that take place within schools, within the education community that we support our students and that we also support each other, even seeing within the chat uh, function there, people responding around, for example, how to reference uh, sort of, you know, there are ways that are being produced that we can turn to. And so as a community of practice, being able to share that. So all that remains is for me to say, Big thank you to both Jason and Marnie for their wonderful insights and presentations. And thank you to you for making the time to join us. I hope you found this a useful experience.